Everyone, can we get started? So, uh, welcome to Machine Learning Lunch. Machine Learning Lunch is a seminar. We have a website. There's a list of all sorts of exciting upcoming talks. Uh, today, uh, we're very excited to have David Bannon, uh, who's a PhD student in Language Technology Institute, LTI, here in uh, SCS at CMU, um, uh, advised by Noah Smith. Uh, I've had the privilege of being able to work with David for a few projects. Um, in the past, uh, before coming to CMU, David was a researcher at the Perseus Project at Tufts, where he worked on computation and visualization for uh, classic, the classics, like speech and light and stuff. And without further ado. Great, thank you. Uh, so I know that um, this talk was really meant to be open to people both in computer science and in the humanities. And I'm kind of curious, by a show of hands, what sort of representation we have here today. So who here? hails from English or some other discipline which, which self-identifies more in the humanities here? Raise your hand. Three people, okay, four people, that's not bad. It's more than I maybe expected. And the rest of you, I suppose, are from computer science, right? Okay. Social science, oh, so yeah, so of course is this, this whole other interdisciplinary uh, range of, of computational social science, which I think is um, really the occasion for giving this talk, right? So over the past five or 10 years, there's been this huge rise in applying techniques from machine learning to, to disciplines like political science, to economics and finance, to, to, uh, to cognitive psychology, to general social sciences that involve really interesting modeling choices, right? So I think a lot of the, the classic stuff, the classic machinery that we have like collapsed Gibbs sampling for LDA, like the Indian buffet process, comes in part from like the intersection of cognitive psychologists with machine learning. Uh, at the same time that all this has been going on, there has been this kind of concomitant rise in what's called the digital humanities. So it's a really notoriously difficult thing to define, but it involves a lot of applying quantitative methods, computational methods, to answer questions that you know, are really of central concern to humanities kinds of, kinds of things. Uh, now, it's not to say that people haven't been using quantitative methods or computation even the humanities for a long time, they have. I think a lot of the, early, the work of the early um, 19th century German philologists really just involved counting, which is exactly just the sort of quantitative approach that, that we're talking about for, for computational humanities too. Um, what I think, so this is a machine learning lunch here. You know, most of you guys are machine learning people or at least CS people from the sounds of it. And I think the argument, the big picture that I wanna sort of paint here is that the humanities really present a really interesting opportunity, not just for these sort of intrinsic problems that they're caring to solve, which I think is what gets people interested in this space of computational humanities in the first place, but because there's a, it, it, prevents a, it presents a space for really interesting modeling choices too. So just to give a couple of examples of this from recent uh, CS conferences for work that is not my own, at ACL this year there was a great paper on using um, uh, really interesting modeling choices of hidden semi-Markov models to try and model historical typesetting <coughs> for OCR. So, I mean, OCR, for all of you who are not in sort of text-based machine learning or the humanities, OCR is this problem of trying to recognize all the, the characters that are in an image of a text, right? For, for business documents that are printed in 2013, it's essentially solved. But for texts that are printed in 1789, you know, it's essentially the same problem of recognizing handwriting. It's really difficult. And so to try and do this well in an unsupervised way, it's really interesting to try and add additional variables that include things like the, how the baseline wanders, so what kind of fonts you have to represent different glyphs, right? So S's and F's look very similar in these sort of older fonts. And according you know, also the sort of the, these issues of uh, the, the density of the ink that's being pressed on from these uh, old presses that aren't necessarily have the same kind of quality of those that we have today. <laughs> Uh, at UAI, a couple years ago, there was David Mibno's paper on reconstructing Pompeian households. So, uh, you know, Pompeii is this, you know, area that was smothered by this volcano in the first century that, you know, it really interesting sort of modeling choice of trying to apply mixed membership models over all these objects that are being preserved in this Pompeian household. To give a shout out to work that's going on here at CMU, there's a Six Degrees of Francis Bacon project that is jointly being undertaken by Chris Warren in the English department and Mike Feingold and Cosma Shalizi in stats. Really interesting problem here of trying to infer the network structure of uh, the early modern period centered around the, the character of Francis Bacon. <clears throat> in the early modern period from around 1550 to 1700, 
um, again, sort of interesting modeling choices here being made about trying to recover this graph uh, with really sparse, with, you know, which has to be necessarily sparse using the Poisson graph, graphical lasso. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is a couple of things that I've been working on over the past year and will continue to work on for the imminent future. Um, and I think when, as I'm talking through these things, we'll definitely cover this first one of learning latent personas of film characters that I presented at ACL this past year. I want to sort of take a kind of casual approach to this, though. So if you have questions or comments as I'm giving this talk, feel free just to raise your hand or throw them out. Uh, we can have, it's totally fine, I think, to be diverted into a discussion as we, you know, these sort of issues sort of keep coming up. If there's time, I'll also talk about inferring social rank in an old Assyrian trade network that I presented this year at the Digital Humanities Conference. But these two really sort of touch on two very different ways of intersecting with humanities kinds of questions. The first is intended to be a sort of general technique for inferring character types or entity types in text. The second one is designed uh, to, be, to answer a, a very focused question that Assyriologists have about the reconstruction of a social network from the second millennium BC that's really directed toward answering a very specific question that is originated from the humanities. So the first question, the first thing that I'll talk about here is this question of how it is that we recognize entity types in text. So an entity type can be a lot of different things. In the most general case, you can think of this as being a kind of group membership, right? How it is that you recognize, we all have, you know, we all have these images of what a policeman is, what a firefighter is. How do we know that? How do we describe that? What, is, what does a policeman do? How do you know a policeman when you see him? Um, it can, in the work that I'm talking about right now, this will span character types. So policemen is one thing that exists in the real world, you'd think, firefighters do as well. You might also apply this sort of same sort of inference to questions of inferring what the dirty cop is. So in, you know, there's a lot of movies that you might just look through and say that there are a lot of character types that show up over and over again in these movies. How do you recognize a dirty cop when you see him? Right? What are the defining attributes of those of characters who, who you would call this sort of thing? Uh, in the extreme, you can think of all these sort of entity types as being stereotypes as well. So when people describe President Obama as being a socialist, what exactly do they mean? Like, what are the characteristics of a socialist that are being attributed to President Obama in any of these cases? Now, in, in all of these things, I think it's really important to distinguish between qualities of people that are essentially reflecting their some sort of internal nature and the ways that these people are being described as, as portraying or embodying these types. So this is really important, I think, for cases like policemen up here, where if you ask, you know, if you ask a person what are the defining characteristics that describe the, char the entity type known as a policeman, it's going to vary very significantly depending on whether you're asking some wealthy, affluent suburban neighborhood uh, or a heroin dealer in Baltimore. Right? So they, even though they, they, the same policeman attribute can be predicated of the same person, the way that you describe the kinds of things that typify this class are going to be very different depending on who you ask. Right? So all this is really going to be very dependent on the kinds of descriptions that you're getting from the kinds of people that you want these descriptions from. Now, in the, oh yeah, so all this I should mention too is also has a long history in classic work from, in AI from the 70s on learning procedural scripts, uh, which has been resurrected over the past couple of years by Nate Chambers and others, uh, in learning narrative chains, narrative schemas, the way that these sort of entity types can occupy specific roles in canonical sort of schema examples. So criminals tend to commit crimes, they are arrested by cops who are a different sort of entity class, they're brought before judges, they tend to follow a very typical narrative pattern. So a lot of this earlier work in learning these sort of procedural scripts has focused on exactly these kind of plot structures that entity types can fill. The, the question that we're trying to ask here is exactly how it is we recognize those character types in text. Now the domain that we're working on here is film plot summaries <laughs> as written by Wikipedians uh, in the English language Wikipedia. So again, so the, in, it naturally itself, this presents a lot of inherent biases about what this data set is. It's a, it's a description of characters, of plot summaries of movies by a very specific kind of population, right? Of all the people who write Wikipedia. Uh, it's not representative of the general population, right? That has their own biases of who constitutes Wikipedians. Uh, but what we're trying to do is infer the entity types that exist in these plot descriptions. So let me ask you then, if you have sort of this sort of conception that villains 
occur over and over again in film. Darth Vader is a bad guy. How do we know that? What makes us say that? Feel free to throw them out. The color of his attire. OK. Black. He wears all black stuff, sure. So it's sort of physical attributes, yeah. What else? He's killing people all the time. He kills people all the time. <laughs> That's true, he does. He's probably meant to have the antagonism that we see in fiction. Uh-huh, it's OK. He has attribute qualities like that, yes. Anything else? What's that? The way he talks, yeah, it's kind of scary. Sure. <laughs> Anything else? He appears with other bad guys. He associates with other bad guys, sure. Who, uh, yeah, who? Which is a, it just defers the problem. Sure. Thought. But they, they, there's some homophily that goes on there, yeah. Sure. Anything else? Yeah. So I think those are the big, the big ones, at least. So, the way that. I think I would describe it, is that, yeah, you know Darth Vader is a bad guy because he does a lot of killing, right? As Manal said, he kills people, he severs off people's hands, he, uh, what does he do? He hunts, you know, Jedis, he has a signature move, right? He chokes people a lot. It's not the, the kinds of things that people who are not bad guys tend to do, right? So you can sort of classify all these things as all of the, the verbs for which he's the agent, right? The semantic agent, right? The kinds of things that he's instrumental in, in causing the action to arise from. It's not just that, though, right? So it has, it's all the things that he has done to him as well, right? So all the verbs for which he's the patient. So people fight Darth Vader, right? They try and escape him. They try and they defeat him. They refuse his commands. Um, you know, if we, in the absence of all these things, we might be more reluctant to say he's as bad. You know, it may be just the fact that he kills a lot of people that makes him inherently a bad guy from these descriptions, but it's not necessarily the only thing. And yeah, so he may be described in ways that are things like evil and Lord, right? He's a frustrated kind of a guy. I think actually in the, in the plot description for the original Star Wars, he is described exactly as evil Lord Darth Vader, right? So which gives you a very strong signal of the kinds of, uh, kinds of character type that he's going to be. Okay, so which is to say that the primary way that we're gonna think of, dis of characterizing a character type or an entity type here in these plot descriptions, and probably at large, is in the, in the distributions of the kinds of things these people are doing, they have done to them, and the, and the ways in which they're described. Now, there are a couple of ways that we might operationalize this mathematically. One way is to say that we have three different distributions that range over the support of the entire vocabulary, and that there is a latent distribution that is in the simplex, that includes all the words like choke, like sever, like hunt, and like kill. And when we see a plot description, which has only four or five of these different verbs that are drawn from this probability distribution, you know, the ones that we see are reflected of, of the distribution that's inherent. And we have one of these distributions uh, for all the things that the character is the agent of, all the ones that he's the patient of, and all the, one that he's, all the things that he's at, attributively modified by. Right, it would be a very big distribution. What we're gonna do instead is try and add a little more complexity to this to make this a more hierarchical distribution where instead of having drawing, drawing every verb from the support over the entire vocabulary, we're gonna say that a character type or an entity type or a persona as we're describing it here is a distribution over the same three different types of actions, the ones that you're the agent for, the patient for, and the attribute, and the verbs which you are attributively modified by. But the support is no longer over the, all of the words of the vocabulary, but over topics, right? You might think of these as topics as topics in LDA, fine-grained semantic classes. We'll call them topics just to keep it all simple. But you might think of these then that if this is the, the persona for a zombie, there are five different classes here, five different topics of, th of things that zombies do. They either eat, feast and feed, and these might be think, you might think of these as all the kinds of verbs that denote some kind of eating or consumption. They do a lot of killing, smashing, and crushing, right? This is a sort of co coherent semantic topic that denotes killing, that kind of thing. There's some like loving and liking and missing, romantic type things that zombies tend not to be the agent of. Uh, he's dead and dying and he's happy and joyful. Again, not a lot of, not a lot of the, the actual verbs that we see are gonna be drawn from, from those classes. There's nothing there. 
the kinds of things that people do to zombies, so this is the same support, right? It's exactly the same topic that you have for the agents. But in this case, the kinds of things that people do to zombies, they don't eat them, but they kill them, right? Uh, maybe some people love them, but not a whole lot. And the same thing for all these attributes over here. You don't have a lot of words that are being drawn from these, these topics, which are predominantly characterized by verbs, but you have them being drawn from these more adjective-y like topics, which include things like dead and dying. So, right, is that clear? So we're gonna, this is how we're going to define what a persona is, what a character type or an entity type is here. This is it. It's a distribution over these three types of, of classes, right? The kinds of things that you tend to be the agent of, the kinds of topic-y words you're the patient of, and the kinds of things that you're attributably modified by. This is a persona. This is what we're going to try and learn from this collection of plot summaries. Distributions look exactly like this. So the model that will do that, try and learn all these things from here, is this what we call the Dirichlet persona model. I'll get to what all these things mean, but I want to introduce the data first. What we're doing here is specifying the generative process by which we get the two things that we actually see. The two things that we see are that Darth Vader is the subject, which is to say the role, of kills. All the words, all the verbs. And they're clustered by all of the, the verbs that are associated with an entity within a particular movie. Uh, and that's what these plates are, but I'll get to that in a little bit. What I want to talk about first is what the actual data structure is that we're giving into the model to learn all these things. So we have about 44,000 movie plot summaries from Wikipedia, which all, you know, have their own inherent biases about what they're actually reporting about these characters, but this is the data that we have. It looks like this, right? So the rebels analyze the Death Star plans, disclose, disclosing a vulnerable exhaust core leading to the station's main reactor. What we get, take from all this, after segmenting all the into sentences, the first thing that we do is take all these sentences and cluster all of the entities, all the mentions, into the same, all the cluster all the mentions that refer to the same, same inherent entity. This is the task of co-reference resolution. So if you have these three sentences here, the young Luke Skywalker is a farmer, Luke watches as Vader kills Kenobi, then Luke runs away while soldiers shoot at him. In these three cases, you have three different uh, ways of referring to Luke Skywalker. You have the full name, Luke Skywalker, Luke here and Luke here. They all refer to the same entity, right? This is the task of co-reference resolution, trying to figure out which of these entities correspond to the same thing, right? And we just use the Stanford uh, Core NLP pipeline to do all of this. Once we have all these entities, we then do syntactic parsing on it, which gets us these syn syntactically, semantically sort of relationships that specify that farmer is an attribute of this entity, Luke Skywalker, that young is an entity of Luke Skywalker, that Luke is the agent of this verb watches, Vader is the agent of this, Kenobi is the direct object of that, the patient of that, right? Just standard syntactic parsing, which gives us these, these sort of semantic key kind of relationships. So what we get then, what is input into our model is exactly this right here. You have three different entities who you know by Luke, Kenobi, and Vader, <coughs> along with all of the typed dependency relationships that fall according to these specified patterns of the words that are attributively dependent on those head words, all the verbs for which this entity is the agent, and all the verbs for which the entity is the patient. Right? So from this data set right here, we get exactly this right here. And this is what goes into our model. So the model then is this. For every movie, every plot summary that we have from Wikipedia, which is to say every collection of, of these sorts of objects, which are grouped by one movie, what we do is draw a distribution over character types specific to that movie. That's what this theta is right here. It's collapsed out for inference, but we'll paint it here anyway. For every entity type, that we, for every entity that we see in these plot summaries, right, so for Luke, for Darth Vader, for Obi-Wan Kenobi, we draw a single persona, a single character type that that character plays in this movie. Psi over here is exactly this Threefold distribution over um, for every persona, for every character type, is a distribution over the latent topics that you expect to see for that persona. So if you think back to the zombie class, this is exactly what you see reflected in Psy right here. They're drawn, each of those things, it's a, you can think of it as being a P persona by K topic by three dimensional, you know, multi dimensional matrix or tensor. Uh, that, that is each, where, each, uh, where each vector is drawn from uh, a Dirichlet parameterized by a role-specific hyperparameter nu. 
phi here is the distribution of topics to words. so this is knowing that there is a love topic and it's perhaps the most likely words in this love topic include things like love, like, and this. so for every persona here for every time that we observe a verb an attribute that it's modified by a verb that's the agent of or the verb that's the patient of we draw the latent topic indicator from this persona um, multinomial that's uh, indicated by the specific persona that's been uh, attributed to that particular entity so we draw a latent topic and then we draw the word given the topic from the phi which is the topic word distribution repeat this for all of the words that are associated with a particular entity for Luke Skywalker repeat it for all of the entities that are in the movie plot summary and we repeat it for all of the different plot summaries that we have in the entire data set this is the entire generative process that gets us the data that we see for inference we use collapse Gibbs sampling where we alternate between sampling the persona conditioned on its conditioned on the uh, the Markov blanket here which is in this case uh, all of the observed topic indicators that we have for, an, for a particular persona collapsing out theta and psi once we sample all of those we then cycle through and sample all of the topic indicators conditioned on this, the persona that we have for that individual so before getting into the results uh, for that particular model I want to introduce a second one here beforehand and the second model here really um, exploits the fact that we have a lot of other information about these character types that we know not just from the things that they do so in this particular case you know that Darth Vader is a, is a character in the movie Star Wars which is a science fiction movie it's an adventure it's a space opera it's a fantasy it's a family film it's an action movie which means that even if we don't know if we even if we have no information whatsoever about the kinds of things that Darth Vader does we have prior information about the kinds of character types he's likely to play just given the genre of the movie right so the fact that he's in a science fiction movie makes it much more likely for him to be a hero or a villain than it is for him to be a dumb jock we also know that Darth Vader is played by David Prowse who is male and was 42 years old in 1977 so given the fact that he's 42 we know that he's much more likely to play a hero or a villain than he is to play a baby genius right or an old wise man just from the fact of how old he is so even if we have no information whatsoever about the kinds of things that he does even if we don't know that he kills or that he chokes we have some prior information conditioned on all of this metadata about this person that we can also learn from so the metadata that we get comes from Freebase which is this fantastic knowledge base that's pulled from Wikipedia mostly uh, it includes uh, information about the genre for all these movies which come from 365 non mutually exclusive categories for all of this we have aligned this is an example of what the freebase data sort of looks like when it's all cleaned up for Luke Skywalker his date of birth the actor Mark Hamill his date of birth is 1951 which makes him 25 years old when the movie came out uh, he's male he's 1.75 meters high and there's a lot of other information here too that I'm not, we didn't use in this model that we can also use including things like nationality and, and other things like that so for all of the, the the entity types that we extract from the Wikipedia plot summary we match up the character names with this free base name which gives us access to all this information right it's not going to be exact right so there are, there are a lot of times when you have characters who play uh, actors who play characters who are either much older or much younger than them so it's not going to be a sort of exact mapping between the two but it's more or less helpful for the kinds of things the kind of instance that we want to do so in addition then to all the text features that we have for all these plot summaries we also have this metadata which includes <laughs> metadata the granularity of the character the age and the gender and the document which cuts across all the characters that are included in that in a particular uh, plot summary and we're going to use this information to help us infer those those personas that are still going to be parameterized in exactly the same way as we had before as those distributions those type distributions over the kinds of things that a character is the agent of is the patient of and the kinds of words that's attributably modified by so for this then let me present the second model persona regression 
which is going to be exactly the same as the Dirichlet persona model with one significant difference. In this case here, instead of have drawing the persona from a multinomial that's parameterized by, by alpha, in this case here, what we're going to do is draw it from a multi-class, a, a distribution that's parameterized by a multi-class logistic regression. So in this case here, we'll draw the probability of, of, of sampling a persona k as the normalized uh, dot product between, exponentially dot product between this vector concatenation of all the metadata for the character, which includes the age and gender, and the metadata for the movie, which includes all the genre, dot product with all the specific weights for that movie for that particular persona, and then normalize over all the different personas. So what this gets us then is a sort of log linear approach to, to drawing personas that can be a function that's conditioning in all these metadata. This is an upstream approach that is you know, made famous by uh, Lim Nguyen McCallum. So given this choice of persona, everything else here remains the same. So the persona topic mixture is exactly as we defined it before. The topic word mixture is exactly the same as before. And when we generate the actual words that are typed words that we see in the plot summary, the generative process is going to be exactly the same. We're conditioned on a choice of persona. We draw the topic class for a particular word and then draw the actual word from the, from the topic word uh, distribution. And then repeat this for all the words, entities, and documents. An inference here then is going to be a little bit different. So we do Monte Carlo EM where we alternate between keeping the betas fixed, sampling uh, the persona indicators P for all the entities and the Z indicators for all the topics for all the words, and taking a bunch of samples for all of those guys, you know, just doing the standard collapse skip sampling. Given all these samples then, we maximize the multi-class statistic regression likelihood to find the values of beta that fit fit those samples best, subject to L2 regularization, so that one particular weight or a set of weights, a set of features doesn't have too much influence for, for uh, determining what persona is drawn for some given setting of the metadata. So that's the, those are the two models. We're going to evaluate them by seeing how well we can recover two different kinds of clusterings. The first clustering is one of names. So there are a lot of movies that have characters who have exactly the same names. Sequels cause this, remakes cause this. So Harry Potter, for example, has eight different movies. Uh, in all of those movies, there's a character named Harry Potter. There's a character named Hermione Granger, named Ron, I think. Um, and while it, it's not true that all of those characters are going to be embodying exactly the same character types in all these movies, it's probably more likely than it is not. So what we're going to do then here is say that all of those in this particular data that we have, of the 970 unique character names, Harry Potter, Batman, The Thief, uh, they all have lots of different tokens, all, lots of different entities who, who, who fill those sort of clustering roles. Uh, 2,666 in our particular cases where we'd be able to identify group membership like the policeman and firefighter and stereotypes a little bit better. But one question to ask with all this work is, why does it even matter? Why would we even care about any of this? It's kind of like a toy, toy domain here. These are plot summaries. They're not necessarily anything that's going to be really, it's not changing literary theory. We're not even thinking of addressing any sort of questions of literary theory here. There's no, the, humanist, the humanistic impact for this work you know, can be very minimal if we just sort of let it stand as is. And to answer that, I think that what I'm trying to you know, paint here is this sort of framework for looking at these questions of, of addressing all of these questions here in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the next thing that I'm working on is trying to infer all of these entity types in literary novels where there will be a theory to be tested, right? So it's not just that uh, we can try and do this in the absence of, of you know, responses to film criticism, but actually have uh, some sort of theory, a theoretical question that we're trying to answer in looking at these things. Um, but beyond all that, I mean, even what we're trying to do here is have a technique that can learn these entity types in lots of different domains. So I think it has relevance for questions of media bias and framing, where if the question is to try and apply all of this to a collection of news texts, like the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, where you do have President Obama being framed as someone who is a socialist, it's an interesting question to ask then that if you define these sort of entity types as being predominantly influenced by the choice of words that people are using to describe other people, then it gets to really interesting questions of how it is that the media and other sort of people are framing their portrait of individuals. Um, you know, which uh, again, it touches on things like stereotypes as well too. 
and in getting to you know, answer all these things, I think there's a, a really interesting space for adding lots of different kinds of modeling effects, which include things like uh, genre and time period for looking at literary novels to try and distance the effects of uh, the fact that all of Jane Austen might sound the same, to trying to get that, um, the kind of character types that cross cut across lots of different kinds of literary genres and, uh, and time periods and even authors. Um, and again, well, I think one of the most, things, most interesting things too is, is including some measure of the interaction between entities in trying to infer what kinds of entity types that they are. So with this, I think, maybe I'll we'll pause here and see how far we get. We have 15 minutes left. It's probably time for questions. Yeah, yeah, Carolyn? Oh yeah. So much depends upon getting accurate information out of the co-reference and the parsing. That's true. No. So we didn't evaluate how, how well any of those components of the pipeline did. I think in our case we thought that the choice of using Wikipedia was was going to be closer to the classic newswire text that a lot of the core NLP pipeline is trained on that it wouldn't um, it would the, the effect of those the, the effect of itself the effect of its genre would be mitigated by just that closeness to those things. But I think when it comes time to apply all these things to literary novels from the 19th century, it's going to be a huge a huge thing to think about because in those cases, I mean, even just parsing fiction is going to be really it's not at all anything like like Newswire. So I think it would have a much bigger effect over there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's where the interesting, I think that's where you have much more interesting possibilities with adding other kinds of modeling effects. So in what I'm thinking right now, uh, yeah, so there will be, I didn't put it on this slide, but yeah, so I'm thinking about having other variables that, that chart the, the, the evolution of a character's type over the course of a book in addition to the time period that it was written. So yeah, I mean, these interesting things. So the kind of way that we've articulated what a character type is right now seems to be a very naive and static thing where you either are the thing or you're not the thing. And if you are, it's true of the entire range over, over, over the, the, the text that you're considering. But yeah, I mean, some of the more interesting, the more interesting types are the ones that change, right? Are the ones that start out a certain way and, and get flipped on their head by the end. So yeah, I think in all those questions, I think the, 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 the relevance of, the, of this model to the kinds of questions you ask really depend on the kind of questions that you want answered. And if having, Accounting for those effects is important, then I'll put those in. Yeah. Can you take back these slides? Actually, the female model, yeah. So can you talk, putting the critic hat for a second, talk about Ang? Because Ang is a man. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. There are, yeah, so I, there are men who are in all of these. So, yeah, so there are, in all these cases, it's not that the specific metadata that you have is going to be the exclusive determinant for the kind of cluster that you belong in. And again, it's also very noisy too. So one of the things that we had in our paper that we showed was that in Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal Lecter and Clarice Sarling, the investigator, are both belonging in the same cluster. So I think which may speak to the fact that genre here may be having too strong of an effect for, uh, for determining the kinds of character types that you have. So if I were going to keep doing work in the film side, I certainly would. As I'm thinking about the literary, applying this to the 19th century fiction books, I am talking with humanists who will have theories. Maybe we can test, yeah, and evaluating this together. I think, yeah, I mean, this is like really the, the sort of critical question that we're all computer scientists who are doing, evaluating, building these models and, and testing these models according to the kind of criteria that we think have the most meaning for us as we're doing these sort of quantitative evaluations. But if the question here is that, you know, the context of this talk is, you know, using machine learning for the computational humanities. If the question is to have a real impact in the humanities, then of course I think we have to be guided into the kinds of questions that are really relevant. They really stand to have a real impact for, for that field as well. And a lot of that really needs to be built from the ground up. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting observation, yeah. This is something that I noticed actually in looking at, looking a long time ago at, uh, 
it, the effect, the kinds of things that Julius Caesar does in his own autobiographies, Julius Caesar is always a subject, right? Uh, so I think that a lot of those characterizations, yeah, that's true. That could be an interesting thing to include in here. <laughs> That's true. I think when we, when we first started this work, we did play around with generating different plot descriptions conditioned on different, very strange combinations of metadata. So looking at, uh, I forget what they were, but it was like a, a horror movie that's also a uh, romantic comedy. I think there are actually lots of these movies that actually exist right now anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could. But I mean, that's a question. I mean, do any you could look at that to see if people if the things do make sense. But what you're going to get out is a is a bag of words, right? How much sense could you really say that makes? And it sort of like makes me wonder how much do people actually generate from generative models, right? Maybe in speech you do, but does anyone else actually do that for like? So you might have seen whether the as well. Like yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, have you experimented with the size of the topics, the size of the bag of words? The like size of the words. For example, 15 or 20 words in a topic, or see how this makes a difference? Um, because now we only saw five. Oh, that's words, true. Right. So the right. So the, the topics range over the over the support of the entire vocabulary. So the question is how how long you want to fix that vocabulary to be. We did do some 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 experiments with changing between I think a thousand for all these things it ended up being settling around a thousand of the most frequent uh, verbs. Um, but it was always around that sort of ballpark. I think it's it depends a lot on the size of your data set. So if we, if we have more, if we have if we have a, like a lot more data for you know the context of looking at books when you have billions of words as opposed to the you know, 44,000 times 700 words that we have in this case, then we, yeah, this will je definitely increase the support so considerably. Could you, could you say that the, the, the Wikipedia daily report is, is more or less very similar in terms of length of, of the article? Oh, yeah. So no, they're not. So, so the, the ones that are the most popular are always the longest. Yeah. So we need a lot of different words and yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. So, so your your point is that the the choice of words is going to be different there, conditioned yeah, on this on this the size. size. I mean, the, the way that the window you open mm -hmm. to look at the at the topic. I yeah. Mean. Yeah. Yeah, that could be true. Yeah. What's the what's a good baseline like for your evaluation? Like, yeah. How do you compare? That's I've never seen anything like this. No, it's a good, it's a good we, we sort of struggled with that. The, um, in our case, what we tried to do then is have a baseline that was just presenting two different models that we're developing and compare those two models against each other. Uh, I guess our hope is that in looking at this now, other people will also, you know, so we have a, at least a sort of initial set of experiments that people could, could work on and, and do better models that we can then compare against that initially. But at least we have something out there now that people can compare against. In training time between these two models, yeah. um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Do you remember? I think this one had to be slower, but I don't know how much slower. Yeah, that's true. So I mean, that, yeah. So this I mean, well, we have to do. So in this case, we optimized the betas uh, at a fixed regime that was. I think. I think we ended up doing it about a hundred times over the course of 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 the entire overall of the iterations. So I don't think that in itself was the cause. I always thought that was fast. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Sorry. I mean the, the Dirichlet collapse model moves faster because the the implicit metronome was being updated every single time. Yeah. So this one it can only update that top multinomial once every time you have to listen to the question. Mm -hmm. So it's kinda like collapse on collapse. But it's not bad everyone except the Big thing for the bad thing about uncollapsed LGA is the topic word distribution. So those are collapsed too, like when you pick the zero or whatever. Yeah, but okay, uh, so I'm just curious about your comments on like how this would work uh, if you didn't have the metadata, right? and the reason for that is like the, the usual game that you're thinking of. Uh, you may not have any metadata at all. Yeah. 
Yeah. So in this case, I think it's, you can be creative in trying to find metadata for all these things. So in the case of looking at literary fiction, all the characters there, you may not know their date of births, but you can infer their gender to a certain degree by looking at their first name. Um, and the, the books often have a lot of genre information too, so, and a lot of much more fine detailed genre than the kinds of things that we have here. So it's not just necessarily that a book is a work of fiction, but it happens to be a gothic novel or um, a, you know, a, a silver spoon novel they're called. So I think there are ways of getting, putting metadata back into the system, but the other hope is that when you have a data set that's as big as that would be, that maybe the metadata isn't necessarily going to be as important for doing, for all the inference. That we have enough examples, we have, instead of, instead of having five or 10 examples per character that we have in the plot summaries, we have 100 or 1,000 different kinds of, kinds of things that these characters are doing, which, which may be a stronger signal than what we had here. Sure. It matters very much that who they're loving. Yeah, who they're loving. Yeah. They don't love and are loved by the same person. Yeah. So would, would this be able to deal with that? No. Or could you speculate on how? This would definitely not be able to, to deal with that. I mean, so this would, I mean, it would deal with it in the sense that you would have characters who are both loving and being loved at the same time, but having who who is involved in that triangle, this model would absolutely not be able to capture. I think adding these uh, choices of these interacting effects down here, the interaction between entities would kind of do that. We experimented with this at the very beginning of this project in trying to look at the, the kind of tuples that arise between who is doing what to whom, condition on the verb. But in this case, the data was just too sparse to get anything that was a very good signal. I think in, in other domains where we have more data, it may be a little bit better. Uh, or we may think about uh, different kinds of ways of modeling what the interacting effects actually looks like. So instead of having something where X Instead of having to rely on observations of sentences where you, say, where you can actually observe X loves Y, which is probably going to be pretty rare, of trying to think of a different way of, of parameterizing what that interaction looks like, of just, for instance, saying that if X loves Y in the context of, if X does some loving in the context of Y, where Y is mentioned within the 500 words, then maybe uh, another way of sort of Inter including these kind of interaction effects while also dealing with sparsity at the same time, sparsity of the data at the same time. Yeah, you Felix? The summary instead of the actual full script for yes. movies, um, do you have any plans for like novels? Are you going to use the full text version summary? And do you have any ideas of where the trade-offs between the two? Yeah, so there's a couple different trade-offs and kind of like theoretical implications too. So. Uh, yeah, so I'm thinking about doing this for literary books right now. We'll include the entire full text of the book. Um, the big theoretical difference between these two things is that in this particular case, you have the, the description of the movie being mediated by somebody else. In this case, it happens to be by Wikipedians, who you know fall into a very particular kind of demographic. They're like, they tend to be young men. And they may choose to you know, uh, highlight certain actions more than other actions of certain characters more than other characters. For books, though, you're really dealing with a sort of unmediated thing itself, right? It's just, you, all you have is the evidence of what the character is and does within the scope of the book, where the only thing that's really mediating anything there is the author, who you know, is in control anyway. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the books, having the full text of the thing will be a much more interesting space to work in. We thought about that actually here for this too, but transcripts, Movie transcripts have a different kind of problem in that you don't have all the kinds of actions being represented. Like, so the kind of stuff that's, that just is shown on screen, like a car crash, is not described anywhere. It just sort of happens. Yeah. So I guess kind of along those lines, we were talking about stereotypes mm -hmm. in like the Obama example. Yeah. I mean, do you think that is trained on the Washington Post data, trained on you know, the TV station, or do you think of it as like a latent It's hard to say. I haven't thought through this one yet. I think this is going to be some one of the most practical applications of this. Um, yeah, it's hard in that case to sort of articulate what a meaningful difference really looks like when you're comparing what persona assignment is in those cases. Um, but yeah, I mean, having a latent source would be interesting in the cases where you don't know what the bias is going to be a priori.
Okay. Yeah. Alona? It would certainly be different. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, so what do, what do movie reviews get you? Uh, well, they get you the plot summary. They get you a plot summary, do they? Do they give you like a complete one? It does depend on the reviewer, yeah. Um, I was thinking if you wanted to do something similar in the literary world, yeah. it would be Sure. It gets you maybe judgments of, of characters that you may necessarily not have in a, in a more objective summary on its own. Yeah. It's interesting to think about. Yeah, so. I guess one thing I could think about more is get outside of the scope right now is to look at things like Netflix data or recommender data where yeah. you have one type of data talks about a certain type of movie and the other thing is what people like about it. Yeah. Sure. Right. That might your yeah. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Yeah, I know. So in the case of in case of books or movies, you might think of that that what people like is not it I guess the question there is how much it's going to be mediated just by the genre of the movie itself or by the kinds of other things that they like. Because you could imagine some scenario where I like movies where the villain gets his comeuppance at the end. Um, that would be interesting to discover. Yeah. You have, you have information in the model. Yep. That's right. If you had, uh, if you had like a review of the movie or a summary of the movie, can you distinguish characteristics or attributes of the actor versus the character? In a review? Or, or in a summary? In a summary. I feel like we, in, in, the, in looking through the plot summaries in Wikipedia, I feel like I didn't see that very often. It tended to be much more objective about what was actually happening. You know, it's, uh, it's under the category of a plot summary, not necessarily about the reception it's of the movie. Um, it's not to say it doesn't exist. It might yeah. still be there. Right. Um, in, my in my the few that I've seen, though, I didn't see a whole lot of examples of that. Yeah. Okay. 